What is young earth creationism? Is it simply about how old the earth is, or is it a bigger perspective on the Christian faith and the how we interpret the Bible and the relationship between science and religion? Well, in order to answer that question well, we have to do a little bit of exploring into the historical roots of young earth creationism. Once we understand where young earth creationism comes from and what it's reacting against, we can get a better picture of what it actually is and what are some of the main core beliefs of young earth creationism. So we're going to talk about it today on the Science and Faith Podcast. Young Earth creationism is a bit of a misnomer because Young Earth creationism as a interpretation or a theological perspective is about so much more than just the age of the Earth. So in order to understand really what Young Earth creationism is and, and what, it, what the teachings are and what the beliefs are, we have to start with the historical roots of Young Earth creationism. So in the middle of the 20th century, in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, many... Of, uh, of, of certain theological persuasions were concerned about the direction that the American scientific affiliation was going in its acceptance of theistic evolution the, and, and, and in its acceptance of evolution as a scientific theory. And so many people were, many of those within the community were concerned about the direction that it was going. And as a reaction against theistic evolution and the acceptance of evolutionary science, uh, some began to react against that. But in particular, one key figure was uh, Dr. Henry Morris, who was a geologist. And he wrote a book called The Genesis Flood. And he wrote it from a young earth creationist perspective, trying to explain how the flood account in uh, of Noah's flood in the book of Genesis could help explain a lot of geological data, in particular, why the earth appears to be so old. Uh, when it actually is very young, according to their interpretation of Genesis. And so uh, after the uh, 1961 publication of the Genesis Flood, that's when the Young Earth Creationism movement really took off and started to gain ground. Uh, up until that point, there were various theological responses to evolution, and uh, there were people who were promoting a very literalistic interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2 in the, the creation story. Um, but even after Darwin published the, his book on the origin of species, prior, uh, after Darwin published that book, the, the theological response, by and large, didn't really have anything to do with his need for millions and millions of years and for the age of the earth. Prior to Darwin publishing on the origins of species, theologians had already been coming to the conclusion and, and an acceptance of an old age for the earth based on the geological evidence. So before, and this was, this was happening at the turn of the century around 1800 to 1820, uh, the, the geological evidence was coming out. Theologians were in, in mass accepting an old age for the earth. And after Darwin published on the origin of species, there was really no pushback about uh, the age of the earth and, and long geological ages from the theological community because they had already pretty much accepted that the Earth was pretty old long before Darwin even arrived on his scene. And so after Darwin published his book, and then uh, the, the turn of the century into the, the 1900s hundreds or the 20th century, uh, that's when you started to get a little bit more theological pushback from evangelicals and from uh, the fundamentalists who wanted to hold on to a strict literal interpretation of Genesis. And we did a, an entire episode on this, by the way, on John Scopes, and we saw the results of this uh, pushback from the fundamentalists Christians on the theory of evolution, and that came to a full head in uh, in the 1920s with the uh, trial of John Scopes, sometimes called the Scopes Monkey Trial. And so um, it wasn't really, though, though young earth creationism wasn't really put together as a perspective, it wasn't really coherent, there wasn't a, a, a systematic understanding of what young earth creationism was until really the middle of the 20th century, and, and Henry Morris's publication of the Genesis Flood really solidified for young earth creationists uh, kind of the foundation for the movement moving forward. So with that understanding of kind of a little bit of the history of where young earth creationism is coming from, now we can begin to nail down some of the distinctives. So what makes young earth creationism distinct as a perspective and as a view? Well, one of the main distinctives, first off, is the, a literal understanding of the creation week in Genesis. So if you are a young earth creationist, what you believe is that the seven days 
uh, or really six days of, but, but seven of creation in Genesis one are literal 24 hour days. So uh, the, on the first day, God created light, uh, and on the second day, so forth and so on. Every single one of those days, as described in Genesis 1, are literal 24-hour days that God is using to create. Now, young earth creationists would say God could have created in the fashion of Augustine. God could have created in one second. He could have done it in, in the blink of an eye, in no time at all. But he didn't. God chose to to create everything in six literal 24-hour days and on the seventh day rest from all of his work. And he did the reason he did that is because later on in Exodus 20, 11, um, Moses again cites that for, or, or rather God is, is telling Moses, for in six days the Lord your God has labored to create the world, so you labor for six days and rest on the seventh, the seventh being the Sabbath. And so um, young earth creationists would say God intentionally did create everything in six 24-hour days because it set an example for Israel to, how, to, sit, to work for six days and then to rest for the seventh. Now, if God didn't create in six little 24-hour days, then we kind of lose the whole basis for our work week and for resting one day uh, out of seven. And so if God didn't create in six little days, we lose our whole basis for that. Um, and of course, there's, there's some technical um, arguments that go behind that as well. The use of the word, the Hebrew word yom in uh, Genesis 1, which is the word, Hebrew word for day. Uh, when does when to interpret that as a literal 24-hour day, when to not interpret that. And, and a young earth creationist would say, um, you know, when we talk about the word yom day in the Hebrew Bible, when Joshua is marching around the uh, marching around Jericho for seven days, we don't interpret that to mean that that was 7,000 years or that was 7 million years. We know that Joshua marched around when it says seven days, that it was seven days. Those are literal 24-hour days. Or when it says that Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, we don't interpret that to mean three million years. We mean that we know that Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, literal 24-hour days. <clears throat> and so when we come to the book of Genesis and we look at uh, chapter 1, and it says that God created everything in six days, and you go to Exodus and it says, for the Lord your God has created everything in six days, and on the seventh day rested. There's no reason, uh, hermeneutically, to interpret those as being anything other than six literal 24-hour days. And so that's the first major distinctive for, young, to, for, for being a young earth creationist. You have to take the days of Genesis very literally. Uh, the, and when you do that, you get the second kind of major distinctive in young earth creationism, and that is that you get a relatively young age for the universe, and for, uh, in particular for the earth. So if God created everything in six literal 24-hour days, and we look at the genealogies from Adam to um, to Jesus and Jesus to, to today, what we find, not that we're following Jesus' genealogy, but you know what I mean. Like, we know that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, and we have a genealogy of Jesus, and that links back to the genealogies in, in, in the Old Testament, leading from, uh, from Seth and from the children of Adam. And, and in, in Matthew chapter 1, we have the genealogies of Adam leading, uh, leading back from Jesus to Adam. So um, if, we, if we compile all of that and all those genealogies, what we see is that the earth is only somewhere between six and 10,000 years old. Um, and that's a, that's a major distinctive for young earth creationists, hence the name young earth creationists. Uh, but it's not just about the young earth, but that's where that term comes from, is looking at the, the genealogies and interpreting them literally uh, and, and coming arriving at a, at a conclusion that the earth is only six to 10,000 years old. Um, as part of that is the third major distinctive of young earth creationism, and that is that you have to believe in a literal historical Adam. So if you are a young earth creationist, you believe that Adam and Eve were real people that existed between six and 10,000 years ago. They were created by God uniquely from the dirt of the earth, just as described in Genesis uh, chapter 2. And that these two people, Adam and Eve, were not just literal historical figures, but they are the parents, the original first parents, first humans ever created. They did not evolve. They did not descend from a common ancestor. They were uniquely created by God. And from them, all of humanity as we see it today has descended from Adam and Eve. So in a way, young earth creationists do kind of believe in common ancestry and common descent, but they would say we have common ancestry and common descent from an original couple, namely Adam and Eve. They were real people that existed between six and 10,000 years ago, from which all of humanity as we know and see it today 
descended. And so Adam is a historical person. And one of the major, major reasons for accepting uh, a literal Adam and Eve is because of the issue of sin and death before the fall. Because if you, have, if you don't have a literal Adam and Eve, then in chapter 2, then you don't have a literal fall in chapter 3 of Genesis. And so if you don't have a literal fall, which, which according to young earth creationism, gives you sin and death, introduces sin and death into a perfect creation, if you don't have a literal Adam and Eve, you don't have a literal fall. If you don't have a literal fall, then you don't have literal sin and death in being uh, interjected into a perfect creation. And this is a problem because if you don't have a literal fall and you don't have sin and death coming into a perfect creation, then what you have is you have sin and death before the fall. And if you have sin and death before the fall, then you don't have any reason, there's no responsibility on Adam and Eve's part for the sin and death in the world. And then you have a problem with Romans 5, where just as through the one man, Adam, all have sinned, so through the one man, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, all can be made righteous. So you have the, the link and the connection between the first Adam and Jesus Christ, the last Adam. And this is a very important point for young earth creationists. Adam has to be a literal historical figure because in chapter 2, because if he's not, then you don't have a literal historical fall in chapter 3. And if you don't have a literal historical fall in chapter 3, then you don't have literal historical sin and death being introduced into a perfect creation, and you don't get a literal historical Jesus who has come to redeem the children of Adam from, the sin, uh, from their sin and from the curse. So you must have a literal Adam and Eve. And then, of course, this, as I mentioned, uh, there is directly tied to this a major, another, the next distinctive is that there's no sin and death before the fall. So Adam is the cause of sin and death in the world, and uh, no one can, can say that before Adam and Eve there was death and sin, because biblically, theologically, in the young earth creation paradigm, it doesn't make sense. It gives you all kinds of trouble. It gives you all kinds of trouble when you get to the New Testament in Romans 5 and the coming death burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. So without a historical Adam, without death coming from the fall, then you displace the need for a savior and you displace the need for a historical Jesus. And then the last, of course, uh, distinctive for young earth creationism is they believe in common uh, mechanism or common designer, not common ancestry. And obviously they don't, they would, young earth creationism denies common ancestry uh, primarily by evolution through natural selection because of sin and death before the fall. Um, and so the way they sort of explain uh, the similarities between, for example, humans and other primates, for example, chimpanzees who share anywhere between 96 and 99% similar DNA with humans, how do you explain such uh, tight tightly associated DNA, how do you explain how that humans and chimpanzees have roughly 98.5% similar DNA if they did not evolve from a common ancestor? And a young earth creationist would reply, well, that's not because of common ancestry, that's because of a common designer. And so if you have, for example, uh, a Volkswagen, and it has a certain design, and uh, it has four wheels and a steering wheel, and you have, uh, you know, a certain size engine with certain dimensions and aspects ratios and things like that. And then you go to a Porsche. And the Porsche also is around roughly the same size. It has very similar design. Uh, it has um, the same type of engine specs and, and things like that. And you would look at those two cars and you would know that they're very different. A Volkswagen is different from a Porsche, but they also have a tremendous amount of similarities. Well, why would that be? Well, because the same man who designed the Porsche is the same person who designed the Volkswagen. And so because those two cars have the same designer, they have a lot of very simil uh, similar features. They have a lot of similarities. And so for the young earth creationist, he, would, he or she would say, that's why when we look at chimps and human beings, you get a so much similarity. Because they have the same designer, that's why they have so many similarities. So it has nothing to do with common ancestry. It has everything to do with having a common designer. And so that's what... Uh, so sort of sets apart. That's a, a brief overview and introduction to the young earth creation perspective. And that's what young earth creationism is. Those are the major distinctives. If you want to be a young earth creationist, you have to hold 
to those certain tenants. And I realize this is just a very quick video, uh, kind of giving us an overview. And there's a lot more depth we could go into. There's a lot of other issues that we could talk about and cover. But if you want to look, know just sort of what are the main ideas, beliefs, tenets of Young Earth Creationism, those are the major ones. So first of all, uh, yes, it does have to do with a young earth. That's certainly one of the things. Um, but more than that, young earth creationism, uh, just to do a quick recap, has to do with a literal understanding, uh, really a literalistic interpretation of the Bible, but specifically a literal interpretation of the creation week in Genesis. When it says six literal 24-hour days, it means six literal 24-hour days. You have to believe in a literal historical Adam. The Adam and Eve were real people, and uh, they existed between six and 10,000 years ago. They did not arrive through common descent. They did not evolve from uh, a common ancestor. They were the first human beings ever to be uniquely created by God, as described in Genesis 2. Um, there was no death or sin before the fall. And uh, you must believe that because if you don't, you remove any basis for uh, a historical Jesus. So a historical Adam and a, and a historical literal fall means uh, a historical Jesus, a literal crucifixion and literal redemption. Uh, and then, of course, lastly, there is the common designer, not common ancestry. You have to believe that uh, one of the, the ways that accounts for the similarities between species is not common ancestry. It's not evolution through common descent. They don't share a common ancestor. Rather, they share a common designer. And that accounts for the similarities that we see between species. So that's just a quick overview of young earth creationism. That's what it's all about. Uh, if you have any questions, any comments, if there's any young earth creationists out there who think I missed something or uh, maybe describe something and you can describe it in a better way, feel free to leave a comment or uh, you can also shoot me an email. My email address is scienceandfaithdortmund at gmail.com. I get those emails and I'm happy to respond uh, to any, any of you who have questions or uh, some, some constructive comments. Also check out our website. We have a lot of resources up there. Uh, that you can check out, you articles you can read. There's previous episodes of the podcast. The web address for our website is scienceandfaith.de. Go ahead and click on over there and check that out as well. Thanks so much for joining us today. That's going to do it for us. And we'll see you next time here on the Science and Faith Podcast.